the shimmering seas encompassed within the western Alpheric Ocean, are known for their beauty. The Sea of Pearls was likely named for an abundance of valuable pearls, or the iridescent blue-green of its waters. The Azurian Sea is considered to be equally attractive, named for the scintillating swells, coloured perfectly blue. But there is one other gleaming gem to be found in the Alpheric Ocean, and no doubt seaborne explorers share stories of the magnificent, multifaceted jewel that sits on the eastern horizon, like a crystal sunrise. Sailors from the mainland must have gawked at this luminescent landmark, wondering what sorceries powered it. But as they sailed closer to the gemstone, they would have come to the realization that this was no precious stone, but a bustling metropolis. The countless refractions of the assembled crystal structures were hand cut by the inhabitants. This jewel is called Alanor, and it is the capital city of the Somerset Isles. From the ocean on a clear summer's morning, it must be quite the spectacle. With the rising sun above, the city ahead, bathing in its rays, and the water below, reflecting the inundation of illumination pouring down onto it from all angles. The brightness must be simultaneously breathtaking and blinding, with its twinkling towers and coruscating castles. The city is like a swarm of glass insects, splaying their prismatic wings in a daring architectural display. Even my excessively detailed description of the city can't compare with how grandiose the place really is, but it's not to everyone's liking. Imperial emissaries have described the city as a hypnotic swirl of ramparts and impossibly high towers, designed to catch the light of the sun and break it down into its component colours, which lies draped across its stones until you are thankful for nightfall. Architecture is one of the many aspects of Altma society that sets them apart from the other races of Tamriel. They have a particular way of doing things, of approaching their existence in the mortal realm, built upon thousands of years of history, a legacy that goes back so far in fact that they themselves cannot direct you to its source. The High Elves rank nothing above traditional values, but the great irony is they've lost the very things they endlessly endeavour to preserve. Their ancestors fled back to the heavens when the mortal world was made, and even their homeland, be it physical or metaphorical, has vanished. They are a proud people, a pure people, and very powerful on the continental stage, yet they have endured a great deal of turmoil. Many of them left Somerset in great diasporas to found new civilizations. Others still have set their sights on the mainland, only to see their numbers dwindle and to their influence wane. One thing I can say here in the intro with certainty is that if you think the High Elves are little more than pretentious, pure obsessed generic fantasy tropes, then you couldn't be more wrong. The High Elves are the closest race we have to the ancestors of all Mur, the precursors to the many divergent races from Kaima to Orsama, to even the Bretons. All of these unique races stem from the Aldma, and while much of what we know about the Aldma is seemingly lost, there's much more that isn't. Hey guys, it's Drew here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Get settled in for a long one, because today's complete guide is on a race rich in history, with all manner of oddities regarding their culture, society, values, art, and architecture. This is the complete guide to the Altma, the High Elves of Somerset, and where better to begin than their origins. In order to understand their origins, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning, to the Dawn Era. Let's get started. The creation myth of the Ultima is known as the heart of the world. Before there was anything, there was only one thing, and he was everything. He was Anu the everything. He was the quintessential form of stasis, a blinding, ineffable light. And as contrary to his values as it may seem, Anu yearned for change, for variation. What good is being the brightest light in existence when you can't create shadows? Without contrast and conflict, your power is superfluous. In most creation stories, stories, Anu's opposite force named Padamai exists to fill this role. But the heart of the world neglects to mention an equal force at the very beginning, instead suggesting that Anu created his own rival through experimentation. Anu the Everything created Anwiel, the embodiment of his soul and the soul of all things. And in doing so, Anu gave birth to variation and change. Anwiel was capable of self-reflection, and for this he needed to differentiate between the abundance of forms, attributes, and intellects that were rapidly springing into life. 
This chaotic phase of primordial procreation led to the birth of Siphis, the sum of all limitations. This may seem negative at first, but without Siphis, Anwiel could not hope to ponder himself, and Anu's light would have no objects to cast shadows off of. The obstacles provided stimulus to the ever-curious Anwiel, and Siphis, or Padamai as some may call him, would hold dominion over the vast shadows created by Anu's unchanging illumination. The complementary yet contrary forces of stasis and change, of light and darkness, created infinite possibilities, and their intermingling created the dynamic universe we experience now. Anwiel's unchecked rumination soon brought about a desire for order. Anu's response to this was to give Anwiel a soul, as Anwiel had been Anu's soul. This soul is called Auriel, and he is the god of time, the crucial limiting force that provides context and constancy to the Orbis. Thanks to Auriel, all the varying aspects of Anwiel were about to measure themselves, learning their natures and limits, and they took names and became the Aedra. This tumultuous time sets the stage for the Dawn Times, as one of these newly named forces devised a plan to create a new plane of existence within the Orbis. This god was named Lorcan, and he asked his fellow Aedra to aid him in his ambitious scheme, titled Mundus. Brevity is difficult when talking about the creation of an entire universe, but I'll try to cover the Dawn Times quickly. The many Aedra who agreed to help Lorcan soon felt jaded about this new mortal realm. They began to notice that Lorcan was more of a limit than a nature, and when he revealed to the Aedra that they would be tying up a huge chunk of their power in the creation of the realm, Anwiel's souls were irate. Some, like Magnus the Architect and his Magna Gi, fled Mundus. The rifts they left in the sky created the sun and stars, which would, from then on, allow traces of magic to penetrate the mortal realm in the form of light. Others, like Ifra, embraced their fate and became the Elnafe, the Earth Bones, so that the world would not be destroyed after all the work that had gone into it. Auriel and his champion Trinamac pleaded to Anu, imploring him to take them back, but it was too late. The convention was held atop the Adamantine Tower, and Lorcan was punished for his deception. Trinamac ripped the still-beating heart from Lorcan's chest, and Auriel affixed it to his bow, fired it across the world where it sank into the sea. In that patch of water, a volcano sprang up from the bowels of the earth, and Red Mountain was born. The Ultima claimed to be the direct descendants of Auriel and the Aedra, who were gradually weakened by the time they spent trapped in the mortal realm. A parallel creation story titled The Annuad tells us more about the mortal world and the Elnafe. It speaks of Anu's interplay with Padamai, and while the story differs greatly from the heart of the world in the monomyth, there are common threads. In the Annuad, Nern is created, and inhabiting it are the Hiss trees and the Elnafe. Nern was born of twelve different worlds being stitched together, and the old Elnafe were fortunate enough to arrive on this conglomerated world with a large fragment of their former homeland. They fortified their borders from all the chaos of the other eleven worlds, and sought only to preserve their own Elnafe homeland, a land we would soon come to know of as Tamriel. Other Elnafe were lost when the worlds were put together, and they wandered the the chaos homeless. They were the wandering Elnafe. The old Elnafe hid their pocket of calm and attempted to live on as before, and this allowed them to retain their ancient power and knowledge. These Elnafe are the ancestors to the races of elves. The wanderers were scattered amid the confused jumble of the shattered worlds, and had no choice but to travel the new realm, finding each other over the years. The wanderers were more numerous and toughened by their long struggle to survive on Nern. When the wandering Elnafe finally found Tamriel, their prized homeland that had been lost to them for so long, the old Elnafe shunned them. The wanderers were degenerates in their eyes, absence had made them weak, and they no longer resembled their former Elnafe glory. A great war erupted between old and wandering, and it completely reshaped the face of Nern. Some land sank beneath the sea, and the wanderers were scattered once again. They became the men of Atmora, Yakuda, and Akavir, while the old Elnafe retained what remained of Tamriel. The Elnafe are the continuations of the Aedra in Mundus. The Elnafe are also the ancestors to the races of Men and Mer. How much the wandering Elnafe degenerated in their time away from Tamriel is debatable, but one thing's certain, and that's that the old Elnafe did everything in their power to hold 
on to their heritage and their homeland. Thanks to Auriel's enduring influence, time would turn the old Elnafane to the Aldma. But as we see through the Ultima of the modern day, the importance of preserving racial and cultural purity, as well as their heritage, hasn't changed at all. They may only have the Somerset Isles to call their homeland now, but it persists as a bastion of time-honored traditions. Anu, the primordial force of stasis, would be impressed by how little the High Elves have ceded to Sivis' forces of chaos and change. So we know that the Ultima traced their lineage back to the Aedra through the old Elnafe, but there's one more stage in their mortal devolution that we haven't mentioned, and that's the Aldma. The only real distinction between the Aldma and the Altma is that they became known as the Altma after the various divergent groups left the Somerset Isles. The other distinction would be that the Aldma hail from the lost continent of Aldmeris as opposed to Tamriel, but that belief doesn't hold up too well to scrutiny. If you'd like an in-depth explanation of what I mean by that, I have an extensive video on Old Maris, and whether it actually ever existed to begin with. I'll link that video in the description, but don't worry, this is the complete guide, so I will still go over the fundamentals now. Old Maris is described by the Pocket Guide to the Empire as an endless city, built upon itself over and over again, until no nature remains at all. And the source goes on to say that, for countless centuries, adventurers have sought lost Old Maris, only to return disappointed, if they return at all. Some say that Old Maris was sunk into the sea by the angry gods of the Aldma. Others claim that the elven homeland has left Mundus and will only return when the races of Myrrh are united as one. When the Aldma initially fled the continent, it was due to an unspecified crisis. But the Aldma fleet got caught in a storm before washing up on the shores of Auradon by complete accident. But beyond the claims of the Aldma, no reliable proof exists to suggest that Old Meris ever existed, and the claim that the Elven homeland has left Mundus and will only return when the races of Mur are united implies that Old Meris was nothing more than a concept, a metaphorical landmass that represented a unified Aldma race. And with this theory, the sundering of Old Meris is also purely figurative. An out of law source named the Numantia Intercept, from a reliable author named Michael Kirkbride, states the following, the Aldma began to split along cultural lines, on how best to spread creation and their parts in it. This sundering of purpose is the myth of the destruction of Old Meris. Outside of the dawn, and even then only in the dream time of its landscape, there was never a terrestrial homeland of the elves. Old Elnafe is a magical ideal of mixed memories of the dawn. Do not believe the written histories. All mortal life started on the starry heart of dawn's beauty, Tamriel. While I may argue in favour of the notion that the values the High Elves are trying to uphold are based around a fictional lost homeland, that does not mean they are wrong in doing so. Whether Old Maris physically exists is trivial, and that will make more sense as I explain their belief systems. The Ultima obsession with purity and cultural preservation is not because they want to recreate Old Maris in the Somerset Isles. It's because they want to retrace their steps back to the glory of their ancestors. They want to be reunited with Auriel and the Aedra, they want to escape the trap of mortality, a snare that even the Time God himself was caught in. They want to undo Lorcan's trickery and smash through the roof of the House of Sifis, back to Aetherius to be with their immortal maker. They know their origins, Anu, then Anwiel, then Auriel and the Aedra, then the Old Elnafe, then the Aldma, then the Altma. The symbolic stairway from godhood to mortality was descended by their ancestors. They need only turn around and climb it again. But of course, that's easier said than done. Everything about Altmeri culture, religion and society stems from this notion, and the same can be said about their art and architecture. But we'll start with religion. The Ultima have always placed Auriel at the top of their religious hierarchy, but they also venerate other Aedra who they consider to be their ancestors, including Trinomach the Champion, Sirabane the Mage God, and Finasta the Guardian, who is credited with giving the Elves their long lifespans. The transition from ancestor worship to god worship was natural for a mortal race, whose connection to the heavens was inevitably weakening. Some High Elves rejected this change in framing, and created an order devoted to preserving the old ways. 
Pharisees. They are known as the Sidic Order. The general populace followed a pantheon consisting of the aforementioned gods, as well as Xerxes, the god of secret knowledge, Magnus, the god of magic, Mara, the goddess of love, Stendar, the god of justice, and Jepha, the forest god. The Sidic, however, they view the Aedra as being no different to their spirit ancestors, even if they are exceptional spirits with great power. This may actually be the first instance of the sundering of Old Merits, as the Sidic Order retreated to the secluded Isle of Arteum at around the same time that the various dissident groups were emerging across Somerset. The defining feature of the early Old Mary religion was the schismatic movements. The Aelids who left for the heartland of Syrid worshipped Meridia and eventually incorporated other Daedra into their pantheon. The Chima rejected the Aedra altogether and followed the good Daedra. They were even complicit in Boethia's humiliation of Trinamac, an infamous turning point that would never be forgiven by the Altima who venerate Auriel's champion. No matter how dissimilar the splinter groups became, they could not deny that they originated from the Aldma, and only the Altima can claim to uphold the original Old Mary ways. Small changes are unavoidable, but generally speaking, the High Elves have modelled themselves after our new stasis. To change as drastically as the Aelids, the Dunmer, the Orsama, and the Bretons would mean embracing Padamai's chaos. This is a large contributor to Altmeri xenophobia. When they see the races who abandoned the Somerset Isles in the Morefic era, they aren't fascinated by the diversity of appearance and culture. They see groups of former Aldma who have been led astray, who have lost sight of their heritage. In the House of Sifis, tradition is the most valuable virtue. This reality starkly manifests in Ultima society. It is a commonly held belief that High Elves do not procreate as easily as men. Perhaps they view it as a drawback associated with long life. But reliable, albeit biased sources, like the first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire, suggest that it's not fertility that hinders Somerset's birth rate. No, it's their fixation on purity. The guide states that the High Elves consider themselves to be the only perfect race. Over hundreds of generations they have bred themselves into a racially pure line, and are now almost identical to one another in appearance. The theory that the High Elves do not reproduce as quickly or as often as humans is false. Rather, and to my horror, they kill nine out of ten babies born to them in their obsession for purity. Breeding outside the pure line is a terrible unthinkable crime, and taken as prima facie evidence of the tainted blood of the individual in question. Exile to the mainland is regarded as equivalent to a death sentence, since there is no purpose in living outside their ideal society. This genetic uniformity doesn't let up at any stage in a native High Elves life. They have a high regard for order and gravitate naturally towards wearing uniforms and speaking in formal patterns. Their trees and their livestock have been bred to be as ideal as they are. They have no real names of their own, only combinations of numbers that, when spoken aloud, sound to human ears as such. They feel no real tenderness for one another and have no concept of compassion. Of course, many of these observations were made by an imperial, so they must be taken with a grain of salt. The Argonians, for example, operate in a way that is completely alien to men, but they can acknowledge their lack of understanding because the lizard folk are so different, and a human might not be able to comprehend what they consider to be tenderness and compassion. The same is true of the Ultima. They may not be scaled water breathers, but they have obviously made the conscious decision to live in an extremely austere society, and as the pocket guide mentioned, the Ultima disposition for trying to dictate how things live and grow extends beyond the people alone. One wood elf named Ralea Deer, when commenting on Ultima Botanical Standards, had this to say, We're part of the forest and we work together with the trees. The Ultima demand obedience from them. If they can't magically force them into shape, they'll cut them. I've seen it, the obsessive clipping and pruning, and even tying trunks down to encourage them to bend in strange ways. I heard they'll have them uprooted, even after years of work, if just one flower blooms without exactly the right number of petals, or if one fruit doesn't have the proper number of seeds. It's all about control for them. It's horrible. I feel bad for their gardens. I'm not an Altma psychiatrist, but it seems to me that the High Elves, in some respects, try to prove that they are like their Adric ancestors by playing God. In the early days of the Aldma, all elves were considered equal, and so long as the purity quota is met, you'd think that value would endure. All high elves are descendants of Auriel and the Atada after all, but a social hierarchy soon formed around the skills and professions most valuable to society. The vague order of importance is topped by the intellectuals, teachers and priests. Then comes artists, princes, warriors, landowners, merchants, and finally workers. 
The impressive status of artists in Somerset will make more sense when we discuss art and architecture. Much of the influence behind mainland style, language and culture as a whole derives from the Oldma, even in human societies. All human and elven dialects derive from the Oldma language named Elnafex. Only the Argonians can boast a completely unique language. The other races evidently benefit from taking cultural inspiration from others, appropriating it if you will. But the Altima don't have this luxury, as the freedom to learn from others would jeopardize their purity. It seems as though the High Elves generally dislike the idea of going to war with other powers. Not because they are concerned with bloodshed, but because they could not stomach the potential of foreigners entering their isles. Invasion and immigration are synonymous to them. Of course, over time, just like their religious beliefs, their staunch traditional values appear to have loosened. And in current times, many young High Elves have taken the stance that for them to advance as a society, they must modernize and embrace change. This would involve allowing more mainlanders to come to their shores. You can imagine how that notion was met by the masses. The High Elves have historically been spared the tribulations of civil unrest. In the past, those who disagreed with the way the Ultima do things would simply set sail for the mainland. On the rare occasions when conflicts flare up, they try to resolve them verbally, according to the anonymously written Guide to Altmeri Culture. Despite our majestic Adric heritage, we Ultima are not immune to the mundane, worldly tensions that plague the affairs of lesser races. Wisdom and prudence dictate that simple disagreements are best settled through dialogue. Long and thorough consideration, combined with wine and fellowship, often yield reconciliation in short order. When debate fails, they turn to dueling. This practice means that lives are rarely lost to disagreements, and if they are, it's a single life. When compared to many mainland societies, like the Colovians or the Bretons, whose feudal systems lead to countless full-scale domestic battles, the Altima rarely concern themselves with internal warfare. You'd think this would result in a militarily inadequate civilization, but the High Elves have spent much of their recorded history dealing with seaborne invasions, from the Slode of Frass and the Malma of Pyandania. Thanks to these hardships, Somerset is arguably the most dominant naval power in Tamriel. They are also a formidable foe on dry land, simultaneously intimidating and awing the opposition with their beautifully crafted arms and armour. You could make the claim that the High Elves actually sport the most primitive equipment, as they strive to maintain the usage of materials and techniques of their proto myr ancestors. But the continued success of traditional equipment is a testament to how advanced the Aldma were. They forge their weapons and armour from a combination of metals like moonstone and a material called glass. This glass is not the same as you'd see in windows, but is the colloquial name for malachite, a volcanic crystal that is as strong as obsidian and as bright as jade. The end result is lightweight equipment that is both sturdy and sharp. And as with all things Alt Mary, the design is entrancing to the eye. They strive for a simple elegance in their designs, in which flowing lines reflect graceful forms from the natural world. More or less abstract birds, flowers and seashells are common motifs, rendered in rich but muted colours. Armour will be tooled or embossed to represent scales or feathers, and even heavy cuirasses and helmets may sport stylized wings and beaks. On the topic of design, let's take a look at Altma art and architecture. As the introduction to the video made pretty clear, the High Elves have a taste for the spectacular. While Argonians favour disposable mud abodes, and Bretons prefer modest structures of stone and wood, the Altima endeavour to make their cities, and their artistic expression as a whole, worthy of the gods. Human traders have described the capital of Alinor as made from glass or insect wings, and while this may sound metaphorical, the use of malachite and other crystalline minerals could explain this trick of the eye. Aside from Alinor, the Crystal Tower is another example of the grandiosity of High Elven architecture. The tower is so tall that you can see the Dragon's Teeth Mountains from its parapets. The interior of the tower radiates pristine white light and holds a variety of wonders, from its great library to its treasury which is full of ancient tapestries and relics. Enormous elegant towers can be found all across the Isles, and scholars have speculated that the Altima trend of erecting such extravagant megalithic structures, soaring so so high skyward is a result of their belief that they were once gods and that they are descended from those gods. Perhaps if they build their cities high enough, they can leap from the gables and be carried beyond the barrier to Aetherius. For much of history, what the architecture of Somerset truly looked like was the subject of heavy conjecture, but we do have a thorough depiction of the province hailing from Second Era 582. 
We could discuss the potential that this depiction simplified Somerset, even abandoned the interesting lore in favour of making an Elder Scrolls equivalent to Rivendell, but that wouldn't be very productive. The depiction of the Isles we see in ESO still has a lot of character. The ornate structures of marble and glass and metal jutting towards the heavens are still glorious enough to inspire awe. Gastinus Florus of the Masons Guild describes curved gables and strong pointed steeples, which emphasise height, with ceilings a giant would have trouble scraping his head on, and rooftops stretching proudly up toward the firmament. He goes on to say that their structures provide a visual echo to the High Elven appearance, as they try to contrast their structures with the abodes of other races. The Aelids may have diverged significantly from the Aldmer over the centuries, but one look at their architecture would suggest they still share a lot of common elements. The Aldmer are very protective of the finest art their race produces. The Crystal Tower houses an array of hand-woven tapestries, including some ancient pieces, which when translated, reveal vital information about their history. Tapestries in the tower have been studied to learn of King Orgnum, the exiled Aldmer who became the ruler of the Pyandanean Sea Elves, and artworks have also been used to help the High Elves visualise what their lost continent had once looked like. We've discussed the history of the Ultima during the Morefic Era. They are the continuation of the Ultima settlers of Somerset. Once the various dissident offshoots spread across Tamriel, the remaining elves, who all agreed on how best to uphold their traditional values, were left to their own devices. And the first era was relatively quiet for the High Elves when compared to the races of the mainland. Few races were free of conflict during the first era. It was a time when the many civilizations were locking horns over territory. The Ultima were insulated from almost all of these problems by leagues of ocean. There were rare instances of civil conflict. Tensions between Skywatch and Firsthold broke out into war. So too did a dispute between Alanor and Lilandril. But as I mentioned before, constant seaborne harassment from the Slode and Sea Elves proved to be the biggest challenge for the High Elves in the First Era. These assaults were equally abundant throughout the Second Era, and two brutal battles took place between the Slode and Altima in this time. There was the sack of Skywatch in Second Era 1301, and the Six-Year War of the Avicil starting in Second Era 2911. These are believed to be among the most terrible events to occur in Tamriel's history. It's said that the reclusive Sigic Order was crucial in repelling these invasions. During the Imperial Interregnum in the Second Era, the High Elves led by Queen Aeren established the first Old Mary Dominion. The Altima believed that they were the best suited to rule a continent that was caught in the throes of a seemingly endless sequence of power struggles. With Valenwood and elsewhere joining the Alliance, Aeren was able to keep the conflict away from Somerset, instead electing to make Elden Root the Dominion's capital. Aeren was also responsible for an unprecedented and undoubtedly controversial decree, which saw the Somerset Isles open its borders to an influx of non altima immigrants. Judging from the internal conflicts going on in Fourth Era Somerset, which we'll talk about soon, one of Aeren's successors likely relinquished this policy and restored the region to homogeneity. The First Old Mary Dominion failed in its goal of taking the Imperial throne, and the alliance was dissolved. Around 250 years later, in Second Era 830, the Second Old Mary Dominion was formed. A dynastic dispute was causing unrest in Valenwood, and the High Elves resolved the matter by conquering conquering the province and bringing the Wood Elves under their control once again. This iteration of the Dominion was not only allied with the Bosma and Khajiit, but even some Reachmen and their historic adversaries, the Malma of Pyandania. Whatever progress the High Elves made would soon be irrelevant, as the Septim Empire outgrew all of its rival powers, and the whole of Tamriel was unified under the Imperial Crown. This was the first time the Ultima were governed by men, and it would last for many years. At the climax of the Third Era, the Oblivion Crisis ravaged Tamriel, and Somerset was not spared. The Crystal Tower was razed to the ground, but when the portals closed, the Falmor political party capitalised on the confusion, and took full credit for stopping the bleeding. The Falmor had existed as a fringe group during the time of the First Dominion, and governed Valenwood in the Second Dominion. They had been dissolved when Tiber Septim came, but the Imperial Throne was without a Dragonborn leader once more, and the Falmor wasted no time returning to galvanise a suffering Somerset. 
The Falmor party takes all of the traditional values of the Altamar Elves and adds a brutal yet effective foreign policy. Back in the Second Era, during the second iteration of the Dominion, the Falmor had governed Valenwood, and while the motivation of preventing dynastic dispute was great PR with Somerset's allies, the Dominion was anything but altruistic. In reality, pirates had been pestering the shores of the Isles, and the Falmor aimed to eradicate any pirate havens on the southwest coast of the mainland. Now that the Fourth Era was underway, the Falmor planned to utilize similar manipulative tactics. Firstly, they deposed the monarchy, which you'd think would undermine the traditional values of the Altma, as the monarchy had existed for thousands of years. But then again, the Altma had once been equal beneath their revered ancestors. Either way, the monarchy was gone, and the Falmor took control of Valenwood again within the same decade, establishing the Third Aldmeri Dominion in Fourth Era 29. For some years prior to all this, a movement had been gaining traction that revolved around abandoning tradition and embracing modern globalist values. This movement was popular with young High Elves, and came to a head in the form of a militant group named the Beautiful. These radicals destroyed monuments and assassinated leaders who represented traditional values. What exactly happened to this faction isn't documented, but I think it's reasonable to assume that the Falmor put a stop to them. Granted, both factions disliked the monarchy, and I doubt the Falmor spared any sympathy for the assassinated daughter of the King of Shimmerine, but at the same time, the Falmor were staunch Altma supremacists, and did not welcome the notion that their shores should welcome other races. The new dominion renamed the Somerset Isles to Alanor, and worked on bringing the catfolk of elsewhere back into the fold. They achieved this during the mysterious Void Nights, when the moons disappeared from the night sky for two years, the Falmor took credit for their return causing the Khajiit to worship them as saviors. I could go into detail about the Great War that followed, but rather than adding another 10 minutes to the video, I'll talk about it briefly and put a link in the description to our dedicated video on the events of the Fourth Era, as well as a video on the secret plan of the Falmor, which delves into the motives of this powerful faction. In short though, the Old Mary Dominion were beaten on the battlefield in both Hammerfell and Cyrodiil, but remained the preeminent power on the continent. The Empire held on to the Imperial City, but were weakened so greatly that they had no choice but to cave in to the original demands of the Falmor. As things currently stand, they are little more than glorified puppets to the Elves, and Talos worship has been outlawed in all Imperial-governed provinces. The notion of an ascended human being worshipped as a god is the ultimate heresy to the xenophobic High Elves. The Falmor are motivated by a burning desire to return the Altma to their former glory, and by former glory, I mean a time before the name Altma even existed. The Falmor will not stop until they undo the sundering of Aldmeris, until they escape Lorcan's trap and return to the immortal Aetherius, where their ancestors await them. If you think that the events of Fourth Era 201 were the last we were going to see of the Falmor, then I'd tell you to reconsider. I think their grand scheme is only just being put into motion, and the events of the Elder Scrolls VI will revolve heavily around the High Elves. The High Elves, at first glance, seem like a typical fantasy trope. But looks can be deceiving. To a human's eyes, the Altima are supercilious snobs who look down on the other races both figuratively and literally. Their cities are so glaringly bright and ostentatious that any semblance of beauty is overpowered by how unpleasant they are to behold without damaging your retinas. But these differences will always stem from the fundamental values of the races. Men worship the divines because they are thankful for their existence. Life may be tragically short, but it's a blessing no less. And to elves like the Dunma, existence is a test. It makes one better for having experienced it. The Altima, however, they can't take solace in these justifications for mortality. Mortality is a cruel curse, and every part of Altma civilization, from culture and custom to art and architecture, reflects this cardinal belief. The High Elves are emboldened by the certainty that they are the direct descendants of the Aedra, weakened by their surroundings. But the question is, do they have what it takes to undo their mortal affliction? Were the centuries upon centuries of upholding tradition and racial purity worthwhile? Will they return to Aetherius to bathe in Anu's everlasting, ineffable light? And that concludes our journey to the idyllic Isles of Somerset. This has been the complete guide to the High Elves, and if you've come this far, thanks so much for joining me. And even if you didn't stay to the end, thanks for watching, though it's probably pointless thanking you if you're not even watching. I hope you enjoyed the video guys, I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.